Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast, the fastest growing podcast in women's health. Today's Monday, October 31st, 2022, last day of October. Today's podcast is a high-risk birth story I recorded back in 2021 with Dr. Dina Blanchard. Dina is a pediatrician in New York City, and she's a longtime friend of mine from Chicago. She was one of the first people to volunteer to tell her birth story on our podcast to talk about and raise awareness regarding postpartum anxiety. Dina has become a tremendous advocate and a resource for women with postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression, and our conversation is about much more than just her own story. So, for those of you who have not yet heard her story, this is a great one. For those of you who did hear this a few years ago on our High Risk Birth Stories podcast, I think you will find it valuable to hear again. I know that I did. Hey, for all of you listening on Apple or Spotify, I would really appreciate it if you can go on and rate this podcast, preferably with five stars. Thanks in advance. All right. Enjoy today's podcast. Next week, we have a new guest. Dr. Farnes Kia, who recently joined our practice in New York, is going to join me to talk about minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. Thanks for listening. Have a great week. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. All right, we're here with Dina Blanchard. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's great to have you. Welcome, thank you. The podcast we're doing today is uh, one of our newer formats where we're going to be discussing high-risk birth stories. And the the thought about this and the goal is not specifically to discuss a condition or a diagnosis or a complication uh, related to pregnancy, but just to let women talk about their own story, right? Whether it's fertility, whether it's pregnancy, whether it's the birth, whether it's postpartum. And there's so much to learn from these stories, obviously just on a human level, on a medical level, on any sort of like, you know, life level. And I just have found that these stories are amazing. And Dina, thank you so much for coming on and agreeing to tell your story. You're so welcome. And thank you so much for having me. And I agree with you that the narrative of others of stories is so important and actually such an important part of kind of going through many medical processes. And it's the connection, the human connection that you have with other people who have been through sort of similar or slightly similar things. And you don't feel alone. And like, you're the only one who's done this. I think that is really powerful. And um, I'm really excited to be a part of this. Right. Now, obviously, you yourself are a physician. So you're Dr. Dina Blanchard, pediatrician at Premier Pediatrics in New York. You have a medical background, and we're going to be discussing things related to medicine, obviously. But the fact that you're a doctor on one level has nothing to do with your story. And on another level, it does because it influenced your own practice of medicine, which I think is another fascinating aspect of this. I completely agree. And I also think There's this sort of idea that it's like, oh, well, you're a doctor. That wouldn't happen to you. And then part of being able to share with my, with the families in my practice and new moms and new dads is this can happen to anyone. This happened to me. There's no shame in having a postpartum mood disorder. And I think it sort of takes the edge off almost when I say that because it becomes like, okay, I'm not living on high. I mean, I don't practice like that in general, but like, I think there's so much stigma still, though we've made tremendous growth even since, you know, I had children. And, but I think there's a lot of stigma around mental illness, particularly in the postpartum period where many new parents feel that they should feel like everything is, I mean, I like to joke, but like rainbows, lollipops, and sunshine. And if you (laughs) don't, and you're not Insta perfect or Facebook perfect, or whatever social media is these days, you kind of like start to doubt yourself as a parent, which is a terrible feeling. And no parent should feel that way. So creating a space in which that can be talked about and removing the kind of fantasy of what life should look like after you have a baby, to me is one of the most important things right now. A hundred percent agree. Um, so let's, let's, sort of set the stage. We're going to be discussing, at least at first, 
uh, this is your the birth of your second child, AJ, correct? Yes. So tell us at that point in time, you know, during that pregnancy, the, the year is, is 2010, correct? Mm-hmm. Right. So the year is 2010. Tell us just in general at that time, who are you? Where are you in life? Where do you live? What's your family like? What are you doing? Just so we understand who you are coming into pregnancy. Absolutely. So I am 30 years old. This is my second pregnancy. My son, Nathan, I had him really young at 23. And so the difference of being pregnant between 23 and 30 and then later at 35 was a lifetime. But um, the nice thing, I had Nathan in medical school um, with AJ, it was different. I wasn't attending, I was in private practice and I wasn't gonna have to rush back to work. I had already decided I was gonna take four months of maternity leave and then come back slowly whereas with nathan i was back in anatomy lab two weeks later so it was sort of like to me like this amazing situation where i was going to get to have like a real maternity leave that i hadn't had before and honestly it was my easiest of all three pregnancies i had the least nausea I had no other, like Nathan was premature and David, I had gestational diabetes with, and I also had an antibody problem. And with AJ, it was easy. It was smooth sailing. And I remember actually his birth was also uh, super easy. My sister, who was a few years younger than me, hadn't had kids yet. And I remember her saying like, oh, it's not such a big deal. I'm like, oh, don't use this as your scenario (laughs) because this was not my first. And let me tell you, my third wasn't like that either. Like I was supposed to be induced on a Tuesday. Monday, I was talking to my older son's teacher for parent-teacher conferences. I jump up and my water breaks. And within four hours, I have this baby, three pushes, no tears. And then I go home. I really, it was once I got home that the struggles really started to begin but the pregnancy actually was i worked until i was i gave birth on a monday i worked until that friday i was tired but i was able i was it was my easiest pregnancy but the hardest right and you're you're living in new york city right i was living on the upper west side i was working full time and how old was nathan he was about to turn eight and like I said, I was more tired. Like with Nathan, right before I gave birth, I ran five miles. I wasn't doing that, but um, I was. I felt good. Like I didn't feel exhausted. I didn't feel like I couldn't work. I took call till the end. It was. Um, it was. It wasn't a hard pregnancy. I was married to a different person than I'm married to now, and so I think having a baby and then getting divorced about a year and a half later, a lot of that time in between being in couples therapy certainly didn't help the situation. But, you know, going into it, it felt like this was my chance. I was going to do this. Like, and I had such trouble breastfeeding Nathan. And I'm like, I'm going to have a, full, he was, uh, he was full charm. He weighed seven and a half pounds compared to Nathan was like 5'11". And I was like, this is all going to work. Right. I went in with the expectation that this was going to be like glorious maternity leave. I was going to like take walks and go to brunch with my friends and pop the baby on the breast. And it just, I mean, honestly, in hindsight, it's not advice I would ever give anyone to go into a birth with, but it was because on some level that's completely unrealistic, but it just felt like it was my chance to have a totally different experience than having a premature baby in the middle of medical school. Right. Plus, I mean, listen, you're, you're riding high in a certain sense. I mean, as you said, you're, you're done with your training, you're working full time. So, you know, and, and going through, you know, training in medicine is very difficult and it takes a long time. You don't make any money and it's like, it's gruesome. And then you finish and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I have a job. I like what I'm doing. I have, you know, I have a son. We're living in the city. I'm pregnant. I'm feeling well. There's, there's no reason not to expect everything to go okay. And one thing I do want to mention is, you know, you mentioned your son, Nathan. Now for full disclosure, you and I've known each other since you were like one years old, since you were a little kid. Uh, Cause you know, growing I up think in like Chicago. like one and a half. Yeah. yeah so our, our, our families have known each other for a long time. We, uh, you know, obviously I knew you when you were very, very young. And then uh, we obviously knew each other at the time, though not very well. Cause you know, I was, you were in training. I was, you know, just early in practice. But I, as far as I know, Nathan is not named after me. 
he is not okay. Just as amazing <laughs> of an OBGYN as you are. Right. He is not named after you. But full disclosure, when I was pregnant with AJ, I was like, don't put me and, and with David. Actually, I'm like, I had all my ultrasounds at Carnegie, and then I was followed pretty closely with David because it was a more high risk pregnancy. And I remember being like, I can't see Doctor Fox. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always say that until the, I was yeah. getting abdominal ultrasounds. I'm like, no doctor. Yeah, box. yeah. No, I, I've always <laughs> said like, that. I've yeah, known him the, since I was a child. Right. The people that I know, <laughs> the, the people that I know, get divided into two groups. Half of them are like, I only want to see Fox, and the other half is, I want to see anybody but Fox. And it's it's just an interesting how that gets broken up. It's uh, it's fascinating. You know, whether you know your gynecologist or not is is a it's it's a whole other podcast let's put it that way well my gynecologist my primary gynecologist is seeing you guys for scans and high risk stuff is a good friend but she's a woman so it's right. felt different <laughs> like it just didn't feel the same so here we are so you you had aj you know as you said the pregnancy went well you're feeling great uh, physically it was okay at the time uh at the birth emotionally everything as well as you said you're expecting to have this four months of you know uh, maternity leave and it's going to go really well and you're going to be at all the cafes in the Upper West Side or whatever it is, just, you know, nursing all over the place. And so, so what happened? Tell us the story at that point. Right away, I really struggled with breastfeeding and it was extremely painful for me, but I was, I think, actually irrationally committed to not letting AJ have any formula. And it was really a very irrational belief. And I kept breastfeeding through the pain through so like that was and I kept feeling like a huge failure like with Nathan I remember thinking okay he's premature and I also honestly was a first year medical student here I am pediatrician done with training giving advice blah 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 and I can't do it myself and I was working with lactation consultants and I was doing everything and you know it hurt for a long time like about 10 weeks and then eventually it just came together but I think that beginning was definitely a strike against me. I also at first didn't have any help because I hadn't had any help. But when you're 23, you don't need as much sleep. And I'm a person who needs sleep. So I was exhausted. I was overwhelmed. I was up with this baby who was like killing me. And then he was colicky. Mm. And so it was just like one thing after the next. But, you know, of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. But at the time, I started obsessing about the colic. So Nathan was very colicky and difficult. Also, he did have reflux and a milk protein allergy that didn't get picked up until much later. So he was a more difficult child in that way. But that at this point, this was information I had. So I started to cut things out of my cut, cut milk out of my diet. I put AJ on reflux medicine and then he was still colicky. And I was like really obsessive to the point where even though as a physician, I knew that he was fine. He was growing. Everything was fine. I could not, as a mother, relax and calm down about it. I couldn't listen to myself, to my partners, who are my friends. I went to see a pediatric GI. And I still, I couldn't, take, like, I ended up restricting my diet so much. And actually, I, I mean, it turns out he did have a milk protein issue, but he he was able, wasn't able to tolerate dairy, but he could have tolerated all these other things that I wasn't eating. And so I basically restricted my diet so much. And ultimately, with time, he became a better breastfeeder and he outgrew his colic. And it sort of actually was a little easier, maybe for about two to three weeks, somewhere around 11, 12 weeks. And then I realized I had to go back to work. And I started having panic attacks. I was debilitated. The idea of going back to work, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't breathe. My heart was pounding. And I knew that they were panic attacks. Like I knew it was okay. And I was like, I'm having panic. And I was like, I need to go see somebody because I can't go back to work like this. And I remember the day I saw Dr. Gambler, who is uh, my psychiatrist, and I was sitting there, I'm telling him everything. And he goes, Dina, you have postpartum anxiety. And it was like the clouds had parted and like a light bulb came down or like the light came down. And I was like, yes, of course, that's what I have. 
So I, like I, you know, I couldn't even treat myself in the same respect I was giving to my patients. Right. And also you have, you have the, in, you have the insight to know, and that's more than most people would have, right? Most, most people, you know, they wouldn't have any clue of what's going on and they may think the panic attacks are heart attacks or whatever, who knows what they think they're having. And you had, you had a, a great amount of insight and still it wasn't what you thought you had. I think because I was so unwell, I couldn't mm-hmm. even begin to think about what I had. And then when he said it, it made sense. And I was like, of course, that's what I had. The other thing is I always thought about postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. I didn't really think a lot about postpartum anxiety until he pointed it out to me. And I mean, I had never really, I hadn't been seen the thing. I I mean, I, my, when my parents divorced, I went to therapy for a little bit afterwards, but I wasn't in regular therapeutic care. I was, you know, I got, I was living my life, dealing with everything. And this really shook me to my core because it was unexpected and then being able to kind of hear it and look back, I was like, wow, you know, that glorious maternity leave until I started having panic attacks turned out to be like amongst the worst three and a half months of my life in some ways. It was a really dark time. And I never had any thought, intrusive thoughts or thoughts of hurting myself or the baby, but I was miserable. Mm. And I wasn't eating and I, I didn't really want to see people. I was just really unhappy. And I also was hyper-focused on the baby. So like even when AJ was asleep, I couldn't really sleep myself because I would start to like have what I would describe as circular thinking, which I think is something that's very important to point out in postpartum mood disorders, particularly anxiety, is that you often find yourself and I just, I like, I'll start to say it. Like if I have a patient that I, the mom I, or dad is going through something, I'll start to say, do you find yourself being like, well, I can't fall asleep because what if they need to rest me, but I don't want to pump because if I pump and then this and this, and there's just this constant circular anticipatory anxiety around, I find typically either feeding or sleep with the baby. And um, sometimes I'm sure in your experience, it's more related to maternal health in my mind and in in my, and the experience I have with as a pediatrician, it often presents itself as this kind of circular anxiety regarding the child's health, which is a large part of postpartum anxiety or OCD or postpartum depression and understanding that there's kind of different ways for it to present I think was something I didn't even really completely understand as a pediatrician at that time. I didn't really feel sad. I wasn't crying. I was just, I felt like I was not, I was in somebody else's skin. Like I was not myself and I couldn't really describe it outside of like, and I, and I, and I thought like, okay, I'm a new mom. I'm tired. My breastfeeding's having, like, I just kept making excuses for it in my head as opposed to doing something about it. At the time, or even around then in hindsight, was anyone in your life who you were close with, did any of them notice this, that there was something unusual going on? I mean, you obviously, you know, you, you didn't feel well, but you, right. didn't, you didn't piece it together. But can you look back and say, oh, yeah, my my friend or my cousin or my mother or someone said, you know, there's something going on and I didn't yeah. believe them. And who, who, who may have noticed that? There was only one person who said something to me at the time, and she actually wasn't a close friend. Mm, that must have been pleasant. I should have taken her more seriously, actually. It's like she said it very kindly, and I was just like, no, 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 I'm just tired. I actually didn't even feel bad about myself because I, I don't see mental health as a stigma, and I didn't right. at that time either. Mm-hmm. I just was like, I, I didn't, like when I, it was actually like a relief to have been diagnosed with the anxiety because it was like, oh, okay, this makes sense. Like right. This is why I don't feel like myself, you know, and as opposed to just I suck as a mom or I suck at being the mom, you know, which was sort of what I kept telling myself, like, and being, you know, a perfectionistic, you know, type A medical student, you know, right. kind of person, my tendency was to self-blame. And I kept thinking, I remember thinking like, well, if I just try harder, which again, is like a circular pattern, then... I'll be better at being the mom. And if I just this, I'll be better at this. And if I just, if I just, there was always one more thing I just had to do. And then having the diagnosis really took that was a sense of relief in that, like, it wasn't just, it wasn't my fault. Like it wasn't about me. Right. You know, it was like, there was something else going on, but you know, then there are people who have said, who 
once I got, you know, diagnosed and I was more open about it, which took me some time, but there were people in my circle that I was more open to were like, oh, everyone knew that you had like, you know, at that point, people kept saying postpartum depression because no one really knew what postpartum anxiety was. Right, right. But like basically everyone knew you weren't well. And I'm like, why didn't anyone say anything? And then this one person who was my, like, who's, I mean, she's still, she and I share a best friend. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting at my friend's dining room table and her saying to me, I got to tell you, Dina, like with all respect, like I don't think you're doing great. Like maybe you want to talk to somebody. And I was like, no, I'm just really tired. Like I'm totally fine. She's like, you look really thin. Like, cause I really was barely eating, you know? And I'm like, no, it's just because I'm on this restricted diet from breastfeeding. I mean, I just sort of like excused it mostly, I think, because if you're not well, it's hard to one, have insight in that way. And two, it's sort of well, like, like I said, it wasn't in my mind what typical depression looks like. I just sort of felt like, if I were doing better at this, like if I were better at not getting sleep, if I were better at X, Y, and Z, like then all this would go away. And so it didn't really occur to me that like this wasn't my fault and that there was a way to treat it until it got really bad. Once you ultimately were diagnosed and you said you had that aha moment and for you, you did not feel a stigma about the diagnosis, about mental health, which is, again, that is great. I would say that's probably unique. I think a lot of women would feel stigma, unfortunately. But what about those around you? Did you feel stigma from the outside? You know, people who you worked with or people who you knew? Right. Did you did you sense that or did you feel it or was it like even overt? I mean, I think at first I just felt so much relief and mm -hmm. I hadn't really talked about it. And um, my psychiatrist told me that he wanted me to go on Zoloft. And I was like, I don't need Zoloft. I'm just going to start coming for therapy. And he's like, I think you need both. He's like, do me a favor. Try it. If you don't start to feel better in two to three weeks at all, if you're seeing no improvement between that and therapy, we can always taper you off a bit. And I mean, being a logical person and a medical person, I'm like, look, I, I make sense. I'm like, I'm willing to do that. And he was, I, I got lucky also seeing someone who, I mean, he's not a reproductive psychiatrist, but he understood a lot about pharmacology. And he, I was very concerned about breastfeeding. And he's like, so left is a big molecule. It really barely gets in the breast milk. There's studies. It's safe. It's more dangerous for your baby for you to continue feeling like this. And I was like, all right. Like, that made sense to me as a logical, rational physician. And it felt like I really can't tolerate the way I'm feeling anymore. So right. I might as well. And I have to say, like, even though it takes time for, you know, Zoloft, which is an SSRI serotonin reuptake inhibitor, a uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it, uh, it does take the irritability off quickly. And the irritability was a big issue for me. Like I was, I think that, that experience of like, kind of like being crawling out of my skin in hindsight, when I think about it and now as I'm talking about it, I was irritable. Like everything bothered me, you know, like I was just very touchy, which is not my general temperament. I'm very, like, I'm a pretty laid back, like stuff doesn't really get to me person. And, um, that lifted actually relatively quickly. And I was, I was able to actually go back to work. And initially I didn't actually tell anyone at work. And then people kept saying, wow, you seem so chill, Dina. You know, like, you know, you seem so relaxed. <laughs> like, I mean, even probably prior to then to my baseline, I just was, I was more relaxed, you know, and, um, and cause I was now in weekly therapy and I was exploring like other interpersonal relationships that I, I was having issues with that, like, of course, cause you stress, but unless you're working on yourself, you know, you don't know about it. And I do think the medication actually allowed me to make a lot more progress within my individualized therapy because it did take the edge off. Right. And so I was able to focus and deal with some uncomfortable feelings as opposed to maybe that I mean, I'm not sure I would have been able to if I wasn't on medication. I don't know. I'll never know. But it does feel that way to me. And then eventually, I don't know, at some point, like probably somewhere when AJ was about six, seven months. I was back to work, you know, four days a week as opposed to five. But that was sort of where I had been gearing up to get to. And I was back on part, becoming a partner track. And, you know, things were sort of back where they were. I remember, you know, having run into an older colleague and, you know, the colleague was like, how are you doing? And I said, actually, I'm doing well, though. I had a really difficult postpartum period. I had postpartum anxiety. I'm taking Zoloft. And this older physician 
said to me, oh, I don't think you should tell that to anybody else. People will question your ability to be a physician. And there was, at that moment, shame that I hadn't felt prior. And then I said, well, I don't look at mental health that way. And look, I'm a daughter of a psychologist and a social worker. So obviously, like, I mean, I talked about feelings my whole life, you know, but I said, I don't really look at mental health that way. That's not how I see it. I see it like the same way I have to wear glasses. Like my brain's not doing okay right now. This medicine's like glasses for my brain. But I still, I think I felt an undercurrent of shame and I felt like, okay, I don't really want to talk about the details of my case, but I want to change something in my practice. And that's when I approached my partners and said, okay, I think we need to start screening for postpartum mood disorders. And I think we need to do it in a really organized, thoughtful way, because I think we're missing people. Like I missed myself. So we've got to be missing people. And I said, like, it kind of, like, I think back on the year and a half before, like, like how many people did I chalk up like, like, you know, their worry over the child. So like maybe, oh, they're just like more neurotic or first time parents. And like, that was me, you know? And I'm like, okay, like, you know, no one, I just felt so committed at that point to like the idea that no one should have to suffer for three and a half months in silence. No one should have to continuously, you know, question their ability as a parent and feel horrible about themselves in a silent way. And that we as pediatricians saw parents over and over again and it was an opportunity for us to make a difference and I started to read more about it and get more involved and that's when my practice started doing screening and then you don't want to so it was initially a two-question questionnaire and then we moved up to a lot uh the Edinburgh which is a, a 10 questionnaire the initial screen and we kind of made it a hard stop. Your child, the child could not be seen for a five week, two month, four month, six month, well child checkup without filling this out. And then suddenly, you know, and actually I was committed to following it and looking at were we screening? Was it happening? When we weren't, were there specific doctors that weren't? Why was it getting missed? And creating sort of a systems approach so that ultimately, and like, was it being documented? Was the number being documented? Was the approach being documented? And then, you know, sort of, I sort of think, saying like, okay, it's not enough to just refer. Like, we need to have resources. We can't say to somebody, you have postpartum anxiety, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That would be bad. And so, I mean, it wasn't like that. Yeah, yeah. Course. You know, like, we would say, here's some people we recommend. But I felt like we needed more immediate resources. And I had started to build up relationships with people in the field and of reproductive psych- psychiatry, psychology, because it became like a goal of mine to try to change things Look, I mean, would I like to change the world? Yes, but here I was in a position to make changes within my practice and with so many parents, that's already like, you know, if I even picked up one pe- one person who hadn't been picked up before, it felt to me like here I was with this opportunity to make a huge difference. And so we actually um, started working with Melissa Pashby, who's a postpartum social worker, and she, we continue to work with her. We could refer to her and she would see our patients in the office so it was a destigmatized process so for example the baby could come in to be weighed or not or the mom could just come but it was sort of a safe place or the dad if um in that case it was a safe space because it was the pediatrician space and like you know um it really created it opened doors i think for a lot of people to feel more open to it and then we started to develop, we developed more relationships with the motherhood center. And I mean, it came to the point where I had contacts all over the city and put together this list for my partners where if there was a mom we were really worried about, we could be on the phone with a doctor and figure things out pretty quickly. And we also really felt strongly about partnering with the OBGYNs because as you know, um, we work together professionally and I've been to the practice. You know, I we love being a partnership. And I think that what we wanted to say to parent new parents is, you know, whether it was your first, second or 25th kid, 
you know, there is a partnership here between your OBGYN and your pediatrician. And is it okay with you if we speak to your OBGYN? Because we as pediatricians could not prescribe medication for a mother. Yes, we could screen, but we couldn't diagnose. So what we were really, you know, but we created kind of like, you know, um, we put that out there from the new first visit where people would either sign yes or no. If they had said no, when during these discussions, I would usually talk about it. And most people were very amenable to having like their whole treatment team involved in cases where it wasn't an emergency, where there was just either mild, moderate or significant feelings where either it was therapy or meds or something that could wasn't emergent, we could get people in with people in this field very quickly. And we would then call the parents to follow up two days later. And we had, I mean, it was something that we tracked, you know, for a long time until we got it right. And I, I want to just go into two of the aspects that are so important that you mentioned. And the first is that this idea that, you know, when, when women are pregnant, obviously the mother and baby are one unit. They, they go to the same place at the same time. And after birth, they are two separate people, obviously. And the mother is seen by the pediatrician way more than the OBGYN in the first two months after birth, right? We typically will see them once at six weeks, maybe once earlier if there's a complication or we know something's going on. Sure, many of them will call us if they have any issues, but sometimes they don't, you know, realize themselves that they have something related to mood or they do, but they choose not to call us. And we also scream, but we don't see them till six weeks. And I think that one of the important aspects is this realization that, you know, in a, in a healthcare system where people go to different doctors for different things, it is important for the doctors not to be, uh, not to have this tunnel vision. Like I'm only here to see the baby, even though this mother's sitting in the waiting room and clearly is not well, I'm just going to ignore that because I'm here to see the baby. That would be a bad way to do it. And so to to have this realization that you can have a more global um, view of the family unit, including the mother, of course, that's great. And the second thing is, I think when you, when you talk about screens, I, I think there's sort of two elements of the screen. And the first is simply just the awareness, like the fact that you do the screen means that everybody in your office knows that this is something we're looking for, right? This is important. We're going to screen for it. Here's what it is. And people understand it. And that alone is extremely valuable because it just reminds everybody that this is something that can occur and is important to know about. But the second part is actually doing a real screen and not just the awareness because it gives you Number one, a formal process. Like you said, people can't get past, you know, they can't get to the next step unless they formally go through this. And you can show it to a patient and say, listen, you know, I know that we think that these symptoms may be normal or common, but like this is a validated screen and like you didn't do so well in it. And it doesn't mean you have a diagnosis, but it means we need to investigate this further. And that's a lot different than something that's more abstract or vague. And I was wondering if you found that the formal screen like gives you that sort of evidence for people who may not realize that there's something going on in their lives. A lot of people know, obviously, but some don't. Honestly, I've never gotten to the point of having to show any new parent the Edinburgh score because I see it before I walk in the room. Right. So I already know. And my approach is going to be very gentle. Like I will, I don't come in the room and say, Hey, you had your Edinburgh, but I, you know, and you seem like you're going through a hard time, but I do want to point out, we do see the babies a lot and something that um, our practice was always committed to. And this follows the American Academy of pediatric guidelines was we saw babies even on weekends within 48 hours. And we saw them every 48 to 72 hours until they were returned to birth weight, which on average is somewhere between 10 days and two weeks. And um, while that is still within, you know, and I think we should touch briefly on kind of the idea of postpartum blues versus postpartum mood disorder versus postpartum psychosis, but like any severe psychosis, which unfortunately I have seen, typically happens in the first two weeks. So we're seeing that. And then the other thing is then they're back three weeks later, but you've developed a real relationship because you've seen each other and you've connected. And 
part of what we also do, which is something that over, I mean, all these steps, I'm talking about it like it happened with my finger snapping. Obviously, it was a process. But one of the other things we do is I we worked hard to change the way that we take family history. And so um, when I take a family history, well, we now give it actually on a paper. So I do think that people tend to be more honest or open, sometimes on a screening. And we find that with adolescents as well. Um, and so I don't know if there's been studies in pregnant women or postpartum women about that. But I know in adolescents, studies have shown that they tend to be more honest filling out a questionnaire. But um, then they might be if you just ask questions and then it opens up the door, which is what I feel generally happens with the Edinburgh. And sometimes if your regular doctor's on vacation, like I'm thinking of a case in my head, it was a parent I never met and they came in for the two month visit and they had not screened positive previously. And they and the mom was super positive on this one. And I didn't know her before. So it helped me to have that information going in so that I could sort of feel out the visit and think about kind of what was going to be the best way to approach this and also start by reassuring her, you know, going through everything. But part of the questions we ask, similar to like any history of diabetes in your family, any history of cancer, any history of, you know, hip problems in infancy or young child, all those questions, it says, is there any family history of anxiety? Is there any family history of depression? Is there any family history of bipolar disorder? Is there any other, is there any family history of any other mental health related illnesses. And I find on that, because I also have that for a walk in the room, people, it just takes like what I, what the way we present it basically is like, this is something we give to everybody. It's nothing specific about you. And, you know, there's like a whole letter that goes out beforehand, but like, like this is something you everyone, but it's a very important knowledge because what it does is it gives you information about kind of also is this person at higher risk and allows you at that first visit to open up a conversation saying, you know, this may happen, this may not happen, but I want to talk to you about blah, 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 blah. And if you're finding that you start to feel this way, I'm here for your whole family. I'm not just here for the baby. So if you don't feel good, either of you, please call me because I can help and right. I want to. And People have called and it fe- and that to me is like the biggest win because what it does is it creates a situation where we can from the get go saying like, Hey, being a new parent is hard and it's hard. It's different. The second time it's different. The third, and if something feels different or feels weird and it's about you call us, like right. that's okay. You know? And so that I think is important. The other piece you brought up is provider education. We do a lot of, education around um, postpartum mood disorders and things change if there's a new treatment if there's some sort of new information that came out we'll bring somebody in to do education if we you know if something happens in the practice that we learn from that case where maybe like you know certainly early on I was the most it had the most knowledge and experience and there was a situation with a mom who had a previously diagnosed bipolar disorder and then ended up having postpartum psychosis. And I was the second person to see her. And she had noted in the original thing that she had bipolar, but she wasn't on medication. And I know at that moment that, like, that's not what the uh, – a what is that American right. College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends, like in terms of bipolar moms. And I also know that she's a high, high risk patient. So luckily that all got picked up and everything like turned out okay in that situation. But what it did was we then as a group did a whole education around postpartum women with bipolar during pregnancy and postpartum. And it was very important to understand that women with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder have a much higher increased rate of postpartum psychosis. And if they're not on medications, when they come to you for that first visit, the first question is why and who is your psychiatrist? And know that like you need to act on that with the OBGYN and the psychiatrist. And again, in this case, everything turned out okay. But um, it was a point of education, you know, so that moving forward, we wouldn't miss something like right. that. And I think that this is, you know, 
coming back to your own personal story, I think that what this, you know, demonstrates is this was one way, you know, that you were able to take your story and what you experienced, what happened to you and take all of that knowledge you gained and all that insight you gained and all of that passion that you developed over this and then apply it so that it didn't happen to others. Now, obviously, as a physician who cares for women who are going to be in the same, you know, situation as you, you have a real, you know, like opportunity to do that. And not everyone has that opportunity, but that is, you know, one of the ways you sort of turn your story into action, which I think is great. And the other one I wanted to talk about is how you turn your story into action by later what I call going public, right? Not just not just sort of in your own practice and how you handle you know, your, the processes in your office and how you see patients and talk to them and learn, but you really went out. I mean, you were, you were out there, you were interviewed, you were on Vogue magazine. I mean, you're, you're online and you became, you know, somewhat of a, I'll say a sensation because I thought it was awesome, but you know, to come out as, you know, there's a lot of stories online and obviously you're not, you know, you're not the only person to go public on this, but coming from a physician, you know, you're a pediatrician, you're in this world and to talk about it so openly. And again, like you said, there are certainly those in the field of medicine who would say that's a mistake, right? That somehow that you should be, you know, quiet about it and it was going to come to you. I, I disagree with that. I, I agree with you that it's not something that, you know, that should be a stigma. Um, but tell me about that decision, about how you decided to do that and how did it work logistically? Like, what did you do when you said, I'm, I'm going public, I'm telling people? Right. So interestingly, it took me um, a while. Um, part of that was I met a fantastic guy who I'm married to, and we got married and pregnant very quickly. And, um, in the period between not very quickly, like right after my divorce, but I'm saying I got pregnant quickly after we got married. Mm -hmm. I, under um, I understood and, that, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in the period during which I was not seeing anyone and I was divorced and not remarried, I missed my kids a lot during the time, like Wednesdays and every other weekends when they weren't with me. And I started just working a lot and I've always been a really outgoing person. And I just kind of ended up falling naturally into this role where for the practice, I would do interviews or I might do, I might talk about a topic and, um, at NYU there was, um, you know, they have PR people, they reach out, there's no, they reach out to pediatricians, they started to reach out to me, we're affiliated with them, and I started to do more television and stuff for them, and interviews for them, and I just kind of, you know, I just was like kind of comfortable in that role, but I remember, you know, and before, like, during the pregnancy, like, thinking, I'm doing all this stuff, I should really tell my story, but when I was pregnant with David, I was... I didn't want to talk about it because I felt like if I talked about it, it would happen again. Right. And how old was pregnancy. AJ at this time? Meaning we're, how far after AJ's Eight, birth? What, when what? I got pregnant? Yeah, with David. It was like three and a half. Okay, so I it's mean, se maybe, several, several yeah. years later. Well, AJ was born in November of 2010 and David's born in March of 2015. But it was sort of like, I, you know, I, I was surprised to get pregnant so quickly. <laughs> um you know, and in a good way, it wasn't like we weren't trying, but I just didn't think it was going to happen to me. I was 35. Like, I just didn't think it was going to be easy. And um, I was kind of like in my mind thinking about starting to talk about my story. And then as when I found I was pregnant, it felt like, like if I did it, I would, it would happen again. And my life was so, I was in such a better place. Like professionally, I was so, I was more established. I was a partner. I was comfortable. I had been in my practice for longer. You know, I had, was like a pretty established as a pediatrician and in my, in that area. And I felt much more confident in myself, um, which I think was also due to therapy. And I also um, was in a great marriage and, like things in my life had sort of fallen into place in a lot of ways. And so it felt like if I start to talk about this, maybe it's going to happen. The other shoe's going to drop. I reached out to my psychiatrist and I, you know, we talked about, you know, the pluses and minuses of going back on Zoloft before I gave birth. And um, you were not on really, it. You were not on it before. I had come off in between. Yeah. Ah, okay. And I, um, I was scared. 
like the idea of going through that again was so scary that yeah. I was like, I don't care. I, I, whatever risks there are associated, I, I like the, the mitigated risk to me of not having that experience was huge and while my pregnancy with david was far more stressful than my pregnancy with aj my postpartum period was so wonderful in a way now i had set myself up for more success in the sense that i knew i was high risk to have another episode of postpartum anxiety and i didn't ever want to feel that way again because i didn't want anyone else to feel that way certainly not myself and i so i went on medication i also hired some you know we chose not to go on vacations and save to hire help at night so that i knew so i could rest um and sort of get up and pump and i also was from the second i had pain with breastfeeding like at that point also we had made a change in our practice where like you know we had hired a lactation consultant who actually worked in our practice for new moms because like I had had such a bad breastfeeding experience. That was like another thing that we kind of changed after my horrible experience with AJ was not just referring, but actually having that as part of the practice and being able to have moms see the lactation consultants as one of their weight visits they were coming in for anyway, if that was desired by them. Um, and so I had access right away to the lactation consultant in my practice and there were just a lot of, I was more open-minded, I think also, like, I remember with AJ, the lactation consultant I was seeing, said to me, you should really use this pillow, it's good to have support, and I thought, I don't need support, I got this, I have hands, blah, 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 and I just didn't take her seriously, but when Flannery suggested that I use, you know, the My Breast Friend pillow, I was like, okay, I'll try it. Like I was open more in that right. way because I just didn't want to, I was like, I knew that being open-minded to trying suggestions was going to hopefully help me. And it made a huge difference. And David was a successful breastfeeder from the second day. Mm -hmm. And it was just a very different experience than I had had with the first two. I actually, that's like a whole nother topic that I wrote an article about, like how it took me having three kids to quote, like feel like I could breastfeed, you know, without so much suffering. And that, like, that was also an area I had previously felt shame about where here I was like, I'm on it. I got to get help from the beginning. And I went back into therapy. I had already set up with my therapist to go into therapy weekly. Um, I was seeing him, I believe, monthly at that point. And I set up to go back into therapy weekly for the couple of months after the birth because I, I just was so, so nervous like the other shoe was going to drop. And, um, and then it's sort of between being a new mom again and feeling ambivalent about whether I wanted to share my personal story as opposed to advocate on behalf of women. You know, it was actually a, pati a um, patient's mom, um, Paige Bellenbaum, who's at the Motherhood Center. Um, she told her story. One of my partners showed it to me and I was like, you know, I should really do this. And I called Paige and I said, I think I'm ready to tell my story. Like, what do you think? Will can I write something? Will you look at it first? Like I feel a lot of anxiety about it. And then um at that point I actually and I continue to sit as an advisory committee member um at the Sony Institute. And then between like everybody that I had been connected to, um, they helped me to write my story in a way that felt like it addressed kind of the global picture while telling my personal story as well. And um, it got picked up by Huffington Post. And that was amazing. And I was super happy about it. And that is really where it kind of took off from at that point. And people were so receptive. I actually started to get notes, like um, cards from moms telling me like, I saw your article, or I, they would come and say, I saw your article. And then eventually, I can't remember when the Vogue was, but after that, because Vogue is so mainstream, more people were coming to me and people were writing me like, if not for you, I wouldn't have gotten through that postpartum period. Thank you for the referral. And I guess like, you know, with Aside from the fact that I had chosen to tell my story either way, it felt like, particularly given what I had been told by an older colleague, like almost like, okay, 100% I made the right decision because yeah. here I am making a difference. Aside from just in my little practice, like here I am making a difference in the bigger world. Did you get any um, negative you know, feedback? Like the the kind that, you no. know, that other colleagues said? I mean, there anyone said? None. Right. And did you get None. any, did you get any, um, 
feedback from people who said, you know, again, people who knew you and say, I had no idea you went through this and like sort of that type of the surprise, I meaning because they didn't know any of this was going on, you know, that's because a lot of people, one of the fears they have of going public isn't necessarily, it could be the shame, like that type of thing, but also they just don't want people knowing their story. And did you have a lot of people who just said, oh my God, I didn't know. And you're like, oh, now you'd like know my whole story. No, not it. I mean, I did have a lot of people, but I actually felt proud of myself. It's like, great. I had the exact op- opposite reaction. I felt like, good. That's good that I told my story. And I and I would say to people, like, people would say, I'm so sorry. And I would say, you don't need to be sorry. I didn't recognize my own symptoms. I'm a medical professional. Right. You know? And I would say, like, I didn't recognize my own symptoms. Why? Like, I don't expect anyone to have recognized them. And I said, like, there's nothing to be sorry for, but like, if you take one thing away from this, like go forward, if you see, like learn more about this, if you see a, a new mom who needs help or a new dad who needs help, help them, you know, like make it okay. And, and I would say like, tell your stories because the more people talk about what, you know, postpartum, peripartum, postpartum mental health and, you know, their experiences, the less stigmatized it becomes. And I have seen that. I mean, AJ's just turned 10 in November. The difference in the way the world operates is huge. We still have a way to go, but like so much has opened up and people are much more honest in general and about, you know, mental health. And I think, you know, for me, like the greatest day will be when across the world, but, you know, here in the United States, across the country as a medical profession and as a human beings, we can say that we don't view mental health related illness any different than we view diabetes or strep throat or an ear infection. Because when we can do that, that's when we really can achieve success. And so my general message, and I say this to all new parents is like, this can happen to anybody. I was shocked. It happened to me. There are some greater risk factors. Um, you know, and if, uh, if those come up, you know, they get discussed, um, but you're not alone and you don't need to suffer. Like why you, even if you don't want to tell your story, like there's no reason you need to be miserable for the beginning of your maternity leave and then like have a week of enjoyment only to go back to work. You know, there's options, there's things you can do, and this is highly treatable and, you know, important for us to talk about. Right. And I do think that, as you said, one of the things you learned was that it is important for people to tell their stories. And like you said, not everyone's comfortable with that. Some people just, for whatever reason, they're uncomfortable telling their stories, which is fine, which is why I'm so thankful that you're telling your story and that you told it before, that you're telling it again now, that you know people get to know sort of what it was like going through and people are going to connect to that in different ways, whether it's very relevant to them or maybe it's not so relevant to them now, but it could be for a family member of theirs or a friend of theirs. And the general awareness um, about this topic is so important. And we're going to put on our uh, website all the you know links to various articles uh, that you refer to. So that's all there. So people uh, can, you know, can read them and see them. And obviously, you know, you, you practice in New York City, you see patients, you guys have a website, it's uh, www.premierpedsny.com, that's P-R-E-M-I-E-R-P-E-D-S-N-Y.com. Dina, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's, it's so great to talk to you and to hear your story. And uh, obviously, I think you're really bringing us all to a better place. Honestly, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for seeing my story as important. It's awesome. And it's great. Like we did say earlier on, we've known each other for many, many years. But I think part of what's been really nice about our adult relationship is that we've worked together really nicely as an OBGYN and a pediatrician and, you know, referred back and forth. And like, if we have concerns, we can touch base with each other. And I think it's nice. Like, I mean, yeah, we knew each other as kids and our families were friends, but like to now have an adult relationship that's so positive and where we can impact change within our communities and possibly further, I think is really um, the greatest blessing. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman podcast. 
To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.